Hey guys, Frightener22 here, back with my June 30th DVD and Blu-ray update. I've got a great stack of releases to show you guys, so let's not waste any time and go ahead and get right into it. The first one I got is a DVD that I picked up just while I was doing some grocery shopping and stop and shop, and it's a film that I've been waiting years and years to see. There hasn't been a Blu-ray release of this, um, surprisingly yet, but I saw it and I was like, you know what, for five bucks, let me take a chance on it, and I just got around to finally watching it yesterday, and I fell in love with it. So I'm really, really excited to talk to you guys about 1985's Young Sherlock Holmes. Now, as you can tell, this is definitely um, a re-release that definitely probably came on the curtails of the Sherlock Holmes movies that Robert Downey Jr. and uh, J Jude Law were in, because um, you can obviously tell from that poster that they're going for the exact same kind of style that the Robert Downey Jr. posters were going, which there's nothing really wrong with that, but you have to go into um, this film knowing that it's from 1985, it's a completely different story, it's a completely original story, it's not based on any of uh, the original Sherlock Holmes um, works, you know, any of the books or what have you, but this film is incredibly awesome. First and foremost, it's an Amblin Entertainment film, and anytime you see that great, you know, the great Amblin logo of, uh, you know, Elliot and E.T. riding in the sky, most of the time you're in for a really good treat, and in the case of Sherlock Holmes, it absolutely whet my appetite. This is a film that's completely up my alley. Uh, it came out in 1985, like I said. It's produced by Steven Spielberg as well as um, his compadres in Amblin Entertainment, Kathleen Kennedy and Frank Marshall. And it's written by Chris Columbus, who of course would go on to direct so many great gems like Adventures in Babysitting, Home Alone 1 and 2, the first two Harry Potter films, among many, many other things. And of course this was directed by Barry Levinson, who is a terrific, phenomenal director in his own right, responsible for great works like Rain Man, Good Morning Vietnam, Toys, Sleepers, which is one of my all-time favorite films from the 90s, and Young Sherlock Holmes. Um, in this film, it obviously takes place with a younger Sherlock Holmes and Watson, uh, you know, dealing with them at school where they first meet and getting into their first true mystery together. And just, it's really, really well done. I really appreciated everything in this. I love the use of these great practical effects that they were doing. Um, not to give, you know, too, too much away or, you know, any spoilers, but there's a great scene right in the very beginning where, uh, I guess the villain of the film is shooting, um, you know, their victims with darts that makes people hallucinate. So there's a character that's about to cut into this really, really great uh, turkey meal, and right when he sticks the fork in, the turkey head comes out and starts clawing out his face, but in reality, nothing is really happening. He's just imagining that this, you know, hallucination is going on in, uh, in real time. But it's just really cool to see these really great, charming, practical effects and, you know, no CG utilized in those scenes. But that being said, young Sherlock Holmes is known probably most famously for having the first um, computer-generated character in a film. There's a phenomenal scene um, in a church that deals with a priest, and he's looking at a stained glass picture of a knight with uh, a sword in his hand, and this, the knight from the stained glass uh, picture leaps off of, uh, of, the, of the picture frame and stalks the priest. It's an amazing, amazing effect. It took four months for the animators and Industrial Light and Magic to accomplish, and actually John Lasseter oversaw uh, the whole development of the character for an uh, early, early credit for Pixar. So uh, Young Sherlock Holmes is really a cool, um, you know, crash course in history of computer-generated effects, and it's really, really well done. The practical effects down to, you know, the cutting-edge technology that they were using, it, especially in that scene, are all really, really well done. And it just makes you, you know, appreciate a film like this. You know, when I was watching this, you know, going into it knowing that it's a year after a film like uh, Temple of Doom, and there's a definitely inherent sense of, you know, Indiana Jones type of adventure in this. I kept getting, you know, a feeling of like an Indiana Jones type of excitement from this, a Goonies type of excitement, a Monster Squad type of excitement. All these type of films really made Sherlock, uh, young Sherlock Holmes register really high for me. So if you're a fan of any of those films and you've never seen young Sherlock Holmes, I can't recommend this film enough. I had such 
such a good time with it. I thought the performances were great. I thought it was well written. I thought it was very funny. And of course, the great practical effects and cutting edge computer generated effects are just a sight to be seen because they still help hold up really, really well today, um, especially for today's standards. And that being said, you know, since this is, of course, an Amblin entertainment film, it just dawns on me that, like, somebody has to make a really, really comprehensive, like, hours-long documentary about the history of Amblin Entertainment, because that production company has been responsible for so many cinematic gems throughout the decades that it's unreal, that I'm really, really hoping and waiting that somebody does a really incredibly well-documented and extensive documentary on Amblin Entertainment films, because it's so much fun, but I can't recommend this uh, film enough to you guys. It's like five to six bucks on Amazon, or maybe even your local Stop and Shop, but I'm, I just really am awaiting a Blu-ray release of this, because I'm sure it's going to look stunning in high definition. Uh, the next two that I got, or actually the next three that I got, are from the Great Screen Factory line. So the first one we're going to talk about is the collector's edition of Joe Dante's classic werewolf film, The Howling. Um, this is one of my favorite werewolf films of all time. Uh, you know, the dark humor in it, and, you know, another film that utilizes fantastic practical effects, a killer cast that has Dee Wallace, uh, you know, Robert Picardo, John Carradine, Kevin McCarthy, the list goes on and on. It's a great film. Uh, the transfer is nothing short of great from what we've come to expect from Screen Factory. I have been reading a few reviews that some people prefer the DVD, transfer of it, and I'm not really too sure what those people were song, but I thought that this Blu-ray edition looked phenomenal. It's nothing short of, you know, terrific. Everything that you've come to expect from the Screen Factory line, you're sure to be uh, pleased with their transfer on this. And of course, with all of their great, great collector's editions, you get this custom cover art, this time uh, drafted by Nathan Thomas Milner, who is just phenomenal. He just did, you know, a killer job on this. Of course, you get the reversible cover art with that cover, or you can utilize the one-sheet poster, which I always do uh, on the inside since the slip cover shows uh, the newer art, but it's always great to have that option. And then, um, you know, like all these great collector's editions, this comes packed with awesome special features. You get an audio commentary with director Joe Dante and actors Dee Wallace, Christopher Stone, and Robert Ricardo. You get an Unleashing the Beast, the Making of the Howling multi-part documentary, deleted scenes and outtakes, a Making of a Monster Inside the Howling documentary, and then um, a new Horrors Hallowed Grounds uh, episode with Sean Clark where he takes a look at all the filming locations from the film, and you also get a photo gallery and theatrical trailers. So obviously this is another phenomenal knockout collector's edition release from Screen Factory. Don't hesitate, definitely pick up the Howling because it's a stellar release from them, and it's one of the best werewolf movies out there, so definitely definitely check it out. Next one I got, I just checked out last night, and it's the Blu-ray DVD combo collector's edition of Toby Hooper's 1985 film, Life Force. Believe it or not, being a huge, huge Hooper fan, I had never seen Life Force before, and I'm kind of happy that I waited to see it, um, you know, especially now that Screen Factory put out this phenomenal Blu-ray release, because the film looked and sounded wonderful. I mean, I was just blown away. I actually think this might be one, if not the best, transfer from Screen Factory that I've seen so far. I just thought that the visuals looked great. I thought the effects in high definition just really popped off the screen. It's a really cool uh, science fiction slash vampire-esque film. You kind of have to go into it, I think, knowing that, you know, if you go into it kind of telling yourself that it's vampires in space, I think some people might walk away with a little bit more enjoyment out of it than others, because I can understand why some people might not dig this um, a lot. I actually liked it a lot. I thought that it was really well done. I thought that it was very different than a lot of the other um, Toby Hooper films that I have seen in the past, so I actually took a lot away from this. I thought it was really well done. Um, as you can see, this is another collector's edition, obviously, so you get a great cover art uh, by Justin Osborne this time. And then, of course, on the inside, you get this cover art, um, or you can flip it over on the reversible sleeve to use uh, the original one-sheet poster, which I have, as always, on the inside. And, uh, you know, again, the collector's editions, this one had comes stacked with more special features. You get um, the theatrical cut and the approved director's cut, which is the one that I watched, and uh, the only version I've ever seen of the film to date, and I thought it was wonderful. I thought it was great. It runs about 116 minutes, and I found it really, really enjoyable the whole way through. Um, in addition to that, you get an audio commentary with uh, director Toby Hooper. You get an all-new retrospective uh, cast and crew 
uh, featurette um, documentary. You get a vintage making of Life Force featurette, theatrical trailers, TV spot, and still gallery. And then there's a really cool, about 15 minute inter interview with Mathilda uh, May. Um, she plays the uh, naked vampire. Um, that's kind of, you know, the one draining the life force out of all the victims in the movie. She's wonderful. She still looks beautiful to this day. And uh, she uh, delivers a really um, interesting and enlightening uh, interview. So I would really recommend uh, people cutting into that whenever they get this. But as always, guys, another terrific collector's edition from Scream Factory. Definitely scoop it up. Next one I got is, um, of course, a Scream Factory title. And this is one um, from their Chiller uh, deal that they've made with uh, Chiller TV. And this is one of their original uh, made-for-TV films that Screen Factory's picked up for distribution. And this one's called Dead Souls. Uh, I got this a few weeks early. Um, it just got released on June 25th, but uh, I finally got around to checking it out. And uh, it's decent. You know, it's, I think, out of everything that we've been um, spoiled with so far, as far as Screen Factory releases, this is definitely the weakest link of the bunch. I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. This is definitely my least favorite of the films. But it's not a horrible movie by any means. Um, you know, the nutshell version of the story is there's a kid in it that turns 18 years old. And when he does, he learns that he's inherited a house and also learns that he's been adopted. So once he inherits this house, he starts to understand and learn more about his actual family and the brutal killings that uh, happened to them and the whole history about, you know, his father, who was uh, a preacher and what may have led his father to killing his whole family. Not really spoiling anything, that's like the opening scene of the film, and it's actually pretty well done. There's a lot of cool uh, practical gore effects going on in this, which I have to um, definitely give them props for. But overall, once you know you get deeper and deeper into this film, it kind of you know, becomes very aware very soon that this is a film that we've seen done countless times before and definitely done much, much better. So for that, you know, as far as originality, uh, originality goes, Dead Souls doesn't really have that much of it, but it's decent enough that you don't feel like you've wasted, you know, 90 minutes entirely. And you also get a cool genre, um, you know, vet appearance by Bill Mosley, who's of course, you know, been uh, in House of a Thousand Corpses, he's played Chop Top in Texas Chainsaw 2, so it's really cool to see his appearance in this, but like I said, this is a newer film that was just made last year for uh, the Chiller Network. Scream Factory picked it up, and while it's not, you know, the greatest film in the Screen Factory line, being a huge supporter of the line, I'm really happy to have this in the collection. And, you know, above anything else, I've definitely seen worse, but it's definitely the weakest link of the Screen Factory line altogether. But if you're a completist like me, you definitely have to scoop um, Dead Souls up to complete your Screen Factory library. So definitely check it out. Uh, the next three I got are actually early review copies, all from Shout Factory, and they're all ones that I'm really excited to talk to you guys about, because they were all films that I had never seen before, and I actually walked away with um, a lot of love for all three of them. So let's go ahead and get into the first one. This first one is actually slated to hit uh, Amazon and what have you uh, on July 2nd, and this one is called Tower Block. Now, I walked into this not knowing a damn thing about it, but I just popped it on and hoped for the best, and I walked away loving the hell out of this. This film I've been recommending to people left and right the past week. I keep telling people to pre-order this one because I thought it was really, really well done. What goes on in this film is... Uh, there's a bunch of people, a bunch of tenants living in a big high-rise apartment building, and um, over the years it's just kind of fallen victim to violence and really bad crime. It's been very run down. So they're hoping to demolish, um, you know, the apartment building. Uh, they've already been successful demolishing a bunch of other apartment bu buildings around uh, the area of the one that the film takes place in. And the tenants on the top floor of the final standing uh, apartment building are just waiting to be relocated. So um, one year earlier, there's a murder that happens to a kid in their hallways. But since it's so crime-ridden and, you know, there's, it's a very violent neighborhood, nobody comes forward to say anything, to speak, you know, out against what they may have seen about the murder. Everybody just keeps their mouth shut. So we fast forward to a year later where these tenants are still awaiting um, to get relocated. And before you know it, a sniper comes through and starts offing, uh, you know, the last 
of these tenants, so they all have to band together to try and figure out a way to walk away from the apartment building with their lives, and hopefully try and find out who's doing this and get into the bottom of why they're being picked off. So, it is an awesome movie. I mean, it is just so well done. I thought the performances were great. It is crazy, crazy violent. You know, for, uh, you know, a film that probably didn't have a gigantic budget, they accomplished a hell of a lot. A lot of things that, you know, here we might find very taboo as far, you know, in regards to the violence, this film just has complete brass balls and just goes for the jugular on it. There's a lot of crazy shit that happens and deaths that happen in it that you wouldn't see coming. They come very unexpected, but all really, really well done. You know, it, it's a film... You know, if you like films, you know, where it has to deal with paranoia and, you know, just an insane killer offing people, it's very reminiscent of things like Phone Booth and what have you, but done so, so much better. I mean, this is just a killer film, so I really cannot recommend checking this one out you know, any higher than I already have. Uh, on this, you also get special features, which include an audio commentary, a behind-the-scenes interview, and a trailer. So it's really cool to get some special features on this. Uh, like I said, this comes out July 2nd. Definitely hop on Amazon and pre-order your copy. This is coming from Shop Factory, so definitely check out Tower Block. Next one I got is um, a film from director Eric Red, who is responsible for uh, writing uh, The Hitcher, among a bunch of other things. And this is from 1988, and this is Roy Scheider and Adam Baldwin in Conan Tate. This is a pretty cool movie. Uh, you know, it's funny that Eric Red did direct it, because as much as he wrote, you know, a film like The Hitcher, which is very much a driving movie, Conan and Tate is very much a driving movie as well, too. It's about two hitmen who are hired by the mob to uh, take back a young nine-year-old kid that killed, that may or may not have killed a mafia hitman who uh, broke into his family's house, I guess, to, you know, to kill the family or what have you. So the child, in self-defense, may or may not have killed this mafia hitman. So him, you know, him and his parents are put into, you know, witness protection and what have you, but the mob finds them and, you know, abducts the kid, these two hitmen, played by Roy Scheider, who's, you know, a much older, more mature, much more patient hitman, and Adam Baldwin, who is, you know, young, rebellious, very crazy, he's very trigger-happy, are hired to get this kid and drive him back to Houston, where a bunch of mafia men want to talk to him and really get down to the bottom of what happened. It's really cool. I mean, it's really well done, and it's... The whole movie is really, uh... It's really brought home thanks to the performances by Scheider and Baldwin. They're fantastic in it. Um, you know, there are different personalities or, or, you know, the friction in this that really drives this film home for you. It's really violent when it has to be. It's very adrenaline-paced. You know, it's very scary, too, at some times. I mean, Adam Baldwin is just a nut job in this. I think he did a really, really phenomenal job, not only keeping, you know, up to par with Scheider, but at sometimes even, you know, going beyond, you know, um, the, you know, the acting skills of Scheider in this. He really outshines Scheider in a lot of scenes because he is just so charismatic and he's just so crazy that you can't take your eyes off the guy. I mean, he is absolutely insane, but I really enjoy this film a lot. I thought it was really well done, really violent, um, it's a slow burn, definitely, because a lot of the film takes place in the car where they're trying to transport this kid all the way to Houston. So a lot of it takes place in the car, and it's all about the dialogue and the exchanges between the characters. But it's really, really well done, really well written, and like I said, it's really the performances that drive this film home again. As always, Shout Factory gives you guys some special features. You get an audio commentary with writer-director Eric Red, interviews and deleted scenes. So this is another one that I highly recommend checking out when it's streets. It hits Amazon and stores July 9th, so definitely check this one out. And the next one I got is a zany eight, uh, 70s animated film from the imagination of Ralph Bakshi, and this is Heavy Traffic. This one, uh, you know, Ralph Bakshi is known for a lot of animated films, you know, Fritz the Cat, Cool World, Fire and Ice, and Heavy Traffic, which most people, uh, you know, call his masterpiece. I had never seen the film before, so this was a complete blind buy 
um, you know, at least, you know, uh, my first, uh, you know, experience with the film, and I really enjoyed it. I mean, growing up, it was funny, I, I didn't really register Ralph Bakshi's name yet, and, you know, midway through watching this, I was like, wow, this really has a very, I mean, although this obviously predated Cool World, I was like, this has really got, like, a similar tone to Cool World, and then, once I thought about the name a little bit more, I was like, wait, Ralph Bashi did Cool World, too, so it absolutely makes sense. But this is a really cool film. Um, it's about an underground cartoonist living in New York, and it's just about all of his exchanges and all the people that he knows from his neighborhood and, you know, just everything that happens on a day-to-day -day occurrence in New York City and just with his family and his friends and everything that he's trying to do to just make a living and get by in the city. So I thought it was really well done. It's very, um, it's very eccentric. It's very zany. It's over the top. It's very crude. I mean, this is not an animated film that you want to watch with children by any means. It's very, very adult orientated. I mean, there is just some over the top sexually infused animation going on in this, but it's hysterical. I mean, it's really, really hysterical. Hysterical. And as I was watching it, I mean, some people might think this is kind of a stretch, but I couldn't help but feel that this film is very similar to the way that Scorsese, um, you know, shoots New York or, you know, views uh, the characters in his films, especially his earlier films like Mean Streets and what have you. But I kind of just felt that there was a similar kind of narrative that Ralph Bakshi captured in Heavy Traffic that reminded me of early Scorsese. And I think that that's what really drew me to this and really connected me to it, because I just thought that it was so well done, you know, for as much zany and crazy and over-the-top shit that you see in this film, it still, you know, it manages to keep itself grounded if, you know, if you're gonna allow yourself to kind of get drawn into these characters, because it's a well-told story, and I think it's really cool, and, you know, knowing, uh, you know, a bit of Ralph Bakshi's work, I don't really think that people are wrong by calling this his masterpiece. I think that this is, you know, a phenomenal work of art. I still do love Cool World. I think that might just be nostalgia talking, though, and that's another film that I would love on Blu-ray, but I'm sure that's just going to be doomed to, like, a Warner Brothers mod program. But, uh, yeah, this is a really cool film. Definitely, um, you know, an underground gem that was a bit of a surprise that Shout Factory picked up and released, but nonetheless a really, really welcome one. And I would definitely recommend, you know, animation junkies, uh, people that enjoy 70s filmmaking, you know, from that time period, to definitely pick up Ralph Bakshi's Heavy Traffic. Well done. The transfer on this looks great. The animation probably has never looked better. So this is a, a weird one, a you know, very kooky one, but an awesome one nonetheless. So definitely pick up Heavy Traffic. It's Streets July 6th, so definitely get on Amazon.com and pre-order your copies now. It's definitely a good time. Next one I got was a, um, just a complete blind buy. Uh, I was reading some decent things about it. I know that this flopped theatrically, and I never got a chance to see it then, so I figured, eh, what the heck, I have a gift card, let me take a chance on it. So I picked up the Blu-ray DVD combo pack of The Incredible Burt Wonderstone. Now, this film stars such comedic talent as Steve Carell, Jim Carrey, Steve Buscemi, Alan Arkin, and then you also get Olivia Wilde in it. Um, what this is about is Steve Carell and um, Steve Buscemi are friends from an early age that develop a love for magic. And it cuts forward many years later where they're kind of like these big, you know, magical performers on the Las Vegas Strip, very similar to like Siegfried and Roy. And they've been, you know, hard at work doing an act and they've made tons of money. Steve Carell has kind of become this pompous, arrogant asshole while Steve Buscemi is still kind of the nicer one of the two. And, um, you know, interest is kind of waning on their show and their act because Jim Carrey is a newer street magician, very similar to, like, Chris Angel and what, who's kind of stealing uh, Steve Carell and Steve Buscemi's thunder and really giving them a run for their money. So it's a bit of a battle of the wits of two you know, two different groups of magicians trying to, you know, one-up each other the whole movie to, you know, remain, like, kings of the Las Vegas strip of magic. Considering the talent in this and everything, this film should have been so, so much better, but it really wasn't. I mean, I was, I, I picked it up mainly because I was hearing um, some pretty decent reviews uh, from the Blu-ray that people were like, I don't know why this film, you know, flopped, it was actually a lot funnier than people gave it credit for, so that was pretty... Um, you know, that was uh, uplifting to hear because I wanted to check this out for myself, but I can't say that it's a particularly good movie. It's not. I mean, it's not a 
a wonderful film. It's not very funny. There's like probably one or two times that I actually laughed out loud, which is just a shame. It's a total missed opportunity because you have so many great talent in this. The film was actually <clears throat> written by John Francis Daly, who many people would remember from Freaks and Geeks. So, you know, you have great talent writing it. You know, you just had so much great talent behind the camera and in front of the camera that you have to kind of question why it didn't all come together. But like so many projects in Hollywood with talent and budget like this, sometimes it just doesn't come together in the end, which is a shame because this just seemed like it would have been destined for comedy gold, but nonetheless, it's not really a particularly good movie. Although the Blu-ray uh, technical features look great. I mean, the Blu-ray looked and sounded phenomenal. So, you know, as far, you know, technically speaking, it's a great looking and great sounding Blu-ray. So have no fear about that. But as far as, uh, you know, a worthwhile film, probably not worth owning or picking up, you know, I would recommend a rental if you guys are really, really curious, but nothing beyond that. It's really nothing to write home about, but uh, yeah, for Wonderstone, nothing great. And the final film that I just got yesterday and I haven't had time to really cut into yet is the latest Devil feature from Code Red DVD. You can buy all of their um, latest films from their official storefront. It's a big cartel storefront, so be sure to hop on CodeRedDVD.com. You'll, you'll see a store link on there where you can buy everything directly from them, so definitely check it out. But this is their latest um, double feature, and this is part of the Maria's B-Movie Mayhem line, and this is Weekend Pass and Games Girls, Games Guys Play, excuse me. Um, as you can see, uh, you know, this is films that have been out before, or at least Weekend Pass has. It's a crown title that has been out on a bunch of multi-packs, but I think that Bill definitely, um, you know, is giving fans a little bit more here on this. You get cool special features, you get an audio commentary by the director and uh, actor D.W. Brown, as well as a theatrical trailer, and then, of course, you get this paired with another film, uh, Games Guys Play, which I don't know has ever been out before. I know that Games Girls Play has been out on DVD before, courtesy of Dark Sky Films, but, uh, yeah, I mean, if you guys enjoy these Maria double feature bills as much as I do. It's definitely worth picking up. Uh, this is actually the 10th, if you guys can see that. This is the 10th release in uh, the Maria double feature bills. And I think this is definitely worth uh, picking up. I know that, you know, if you guys have picked up a lot of those sex comedy multi-packs, you might be hesitant to pick this up because you've had Weekend Pass before, but I would recommend picking this up because Code Red DVD is you know, responsible for unearthing and preserving so many forgotten gems, and it's worth picking this up just to support them, because they have so much good stuff on the way this year. They're going to be jumping into Blu-ray at some point this year very, very soon. And, you know, it's not like he, you know, they're trying to get you to double dip on something for nothing. I mean, you know, this is out again uh, with, you know, special features this time, so that alone, I think, makes it worth the price if you love Code Red DVD enough and you like supporting independent players that preserve and unearth films that nobody would really ever give a damn about. So definitely pick up Weekend Pass and Games Guys Play whenever you guys can. Like I said, hop on to CodeRedDVD.com and you'll see their store link, which will take you to their big cartel storefront where you can buy all of their stuff exclusively through them. Well, guys, that concludes my June 30th DVD and Blu-ray update. Thanks again for tuning in. And as much as I said that we're going to be doing these DVD updates every single week, I'm going to see you guys with the next DVD update in two weeks because next week I'm only really getting three things, and I don't think it's enough to really warrant itself for um, a DVD update. But uh, after two weeks, I'm going to have a ton of stuff to show you guys. Uh, we're going to have the Kentucky Fried Movie coming from Shout Factory. I'm going to have the Bad 25 Blu-ray documentary about um, you know the history of Michael Jackson's Bad album. We're going to have the four-movie uh, sci-fi marathon pack from Shout Factory. We're going to have... Um, a lot of other stuff. We're going to have Punk Vacation from Vinegar Syndrome, Spring Breakers on Blu-ray. So be sure to tune in in another two weeks where I'm going to have another great stack of titles to review and display for you guys. So until then, thanks again for tuning in. Comment, subscribe, give this video a thumbs up if you like what I'm doing, and I'll catch you guys right here in two weeks with another DVD and Blu-ray update. Thanks again. This has been Frightener22.